This is the best I can do. God. I know you was crazy when I saw you sitting there. I know exactly what was in store for me. Call it. No. I ain't gonna call it. Call it. The coin don't have no say. It's just you. I got here the same way the coin did. <laughs> Welcome back to Whiskey Flick. I'm your host, Terrence Dunn, and I'm so excited to be back this week for more with you on No Country for Old Men. Matt is enjoying a much deserved week off this week, so I'm excited to be joined by a special guest, Marty Patel, who's gonna be with us later in the show for more on this week's flick. Now, before we get the Whiskey Flick party started, as always, we gotta talk about what we're sipping on today. I actually am drinking some pretty solid stuff this week. I am sipping on some Knob Creek Small Batch Nine Year Aged Whiskey. Very, very tasty beverage that I picked up the other day. So uh, cheers to all of you as we get ready to dive more into this deep and complex flick with a uh, deep and complex whiskey. So previously on Whiskey Flick, uh, we gave you all a brief primer to the world of the Coen brothers. And these are filmmakers that, as we mentioned, we're going to be revisiting a lot on the future of this show. Uh, we dissected some of the technical elements of the movie that really stood out to us, including the incredible cinematography of Roger Deakins, as well as the use of sound or lack thereof within the movie. We dove into the key scenes and characters found in No Country for old men, including the ending of the film, and of course, the complex villainy of Anton Chigurh, played by Javier Bardem. We also talked about the film's relationship to the Cormac McCarthy source novel, and how the Coens still were able to leave their fingerprints on the film. And of course, we touched on some of the key themes in the film around violence, isolation, fate and determinism, and even nihilism, themes that we're going to dive into deeper on today's show. Now, you all had a lot to say about this movie, uh, a movie which in and of itself has a lot to say. We got a chance to hear from some of you, uh, both on our social media, as well as on the Whiskey Flick Hotline. So first, let's talk about some of those polls. So when we dropped the new episode, we put out a couple of polls on Twitter to get just some of your thoughts uh, on the film. The first question we asked was, what were your thoughts on No Country for Old Men? And it was an even split, 50-50 right down the middle. 50% loved it and 50% liked it. So that was awesome to see, nice to, nice Nice to see that everybody dug it in some capacity. I know that this film is not necessarily to everyone's liking, right? It's kind of uh, dark and a little bit grim even, right? But nice to see that the, the majority of uh, the audience and everybody who responded had, had a level of appreciation for it. The second question we asked was, we wanted to know more about what is your favorite Coen Brothers film? 33% of you actually selected Fargo and Oh Brother, Where Art Thou? So 33% a piece. Uh, both of those were films that we shouted out on the previous episode as being ones we would like likely cover in the future on the show. And I think the high votes here reinforce the need for us to do that. Coming up next, we had 16% a piece, both for No Country for Old Men, and then of course for The Big Lebowski, which we will be doing on the show at a later date. Uh, it was nice to see kind of a variety of love for the different Coen Brothers flicks. Again, you know, different strokes for different folks. Now, as I did mention, we did also hear from you on the Whiskey Flick Hotline. We did get a voicemail this week from Steve in Ohio. So let's, uh, let's listen to what Steve had to say about his experience with no Country for Old Men. Hey, boys. Steve Kravalchik, Hilliard, Ohio. Long-time listener, first-time caller. Huge fan of the show. Just listen to episode three. You guys already touched on uh, Javier Bardem and how well he plays Anton Chigurh. I think him that is the number one villain in any movie I've ever seen. Just He plays that role so well. And his character is so interesting between like the cattle gun, he's got that shotgun with a giant suppressor on it. Even his hairstyle. I mean, he's got like the hair of a psychopath. I mean, he's just incredibly good in that role. 
I think it's one of those rare movies where the first half is just so wild and extremely exciting. There's so much action, you're hooked right from the start, and then just that suspense just builds up. There's that hotel scene where Shiger and Llewellyn finally have that standoff when they're in a, that town at night. I don't know why it took to that point for Llewellyn to finally realize there was a tracker in the cave. And then I also don't know why he's sitting there waiting on the bed when he knows that Shiger is on the other side of the door. You'd think he'd be like in a corner or something. It wasn't very strategic on his part. It's an excellent movie even though I was never really into the Tommy Lee Jones scenes. Couldn't really get in, interested in his character or his story. Probably why I didn't really love the ending where he's just sitting there mumbling about the dream he had. And Still a great movie. I know a lot of people compare it to Hell or High Water, which is also a great movie, but I don't think it's on the same level as No Country for Old Men. Uh, overall, great movie. Uh, I love the podcast. Keep up the good work, guys. So thanks for the voicemail, Steve. Uh, I think Matt uh, and myself would both definitely agree with you. We're also big fan of Javier Bardem's performances, Anton Chigur. Incredibly chilling. I love that you called out he has the hair of a psychopath. I've never really given much thought to his hair and how that kind of completes the package. But I definitely think you're right in that regard. It's, he's certainly made an impact, and I do think he's, he's one of the great all-time film villains. And I think, Steve, you make a really interesting case about, <laughs> about Llewellyn, uh, like how it took him so long to realize there was the track in the case and the incredibly poor planning of just uh, sitting on the bed right in front of the door as he's waiting for Anton to supposedly, you know, spring in on him, right? It, it, it is it is kind of an interesting point. I think that speaks a little bit to some of the things that we had to say about uh, the Llewellyn Moss character as a whole, and it kind of brings those ideas to life, right? We mentioned the hubris of the character, right? So he, he doesn't think he can be hunted down. He doesn't think that he can be taken out. He's got this guy, right? So he has this unearned confidence that I think he carries throughout the movie, and I think both of those are a great example of that. I also do think, you know, Matt made the point about, you know, one of the, the advantages of, of Josh Brolin's performance of the character is how he portrays him as this sort of like every man and that gives him a certain level of fallibility. Like he's not as good as he thinks he is um, and he's not as strategic as he thinks he is. And I think that's also why you see some of these examples of him not picking up on the tracker and not thinking about maybe I should be in a better position for this simply because he's just ill-equipped to this task as a whole. And last but not least, I think you made some really great points about Tommy Lee Jones and about the ending of the film. It's interesting the way that some people are frustrated or disappointed in the ending of the film and then in some ways how that character and that ending speaks to them, right? And I think that that ties back to some of what we talked about as we were introducing the film last week and this dichotomy between the old men for which there is no country and the young men, right? Like the, the ending of the film and the Tommy Lee Jones character definitely speak to uh, a certain populace. Love the Hell or High Water comparison because Hell or High Water is a, is a great film. I think those are definitely uh, movies that are worthy of being in the conversation with each other. So thanks again for the call, Steve. Really appreciate it. As always, keep the calls to the hotline coming. You can always reach out to us and share your thoughts on any of the films we cover on the Whiskey Flick hotline, 818-660-6369. We can't wait to hear from more of you uh, as we continue on with the show. Now, last but not least, we did have what we thought was a pretty funny story uh, that Dave from Northern California shared on our Instagram in response to us covering No Country for Old Men. Uh, he posted a comment on our post uh, that mentioned, I took my wife to see No Country for Old Men for her 30th birthday. I had no idea what it was about as we were walking into the theater. Needless to say, I typically let her pick the movies now. <laughs> so we just thought that was a funny story. So so shout out, Dave, and thanks for sharing. And yeah, I could definitely see why No Country for Old Men might be a little dark for a date movie. Uh, but I'm sure your wife appreciates the opportunity to pick the flicks uh, going forward. And hopefully you still get a chance to pick them from time to time. Because while it may not be a date movie, uh, it is a great movie. Thanks again for sharing, Dave. And thanks all of you for participating in our poll. Uh, calling in and sharing with us on social media. We always love to hear from you every week. Be careful. Always am. Don't get hurt. Never do. Don't hurt no one. <laughs> you say so. Last week, Matt and I dove into some key scenes, performances, and themes of No Country for Old Men. This week, we're going to continue to unpack this very complex film with a very special guest. I'm excited to welcome Marty Patel to help us dive more into the key themes and details around this film. So Marty, welcome to Whiskey Flick. Terrence, I'm incredibly happy to be here. Thanks for having me. Awesome. We're excited to have you. So but before we get into the film itself, we'd love to let the viewers know a little bit more about yourself. So tell us a little bit about, you know, who you 
you are, where you're from. Give us the sort of uh, about me of Marty. I'm currently in Portland, Oregon. I've been uh, a journalist uh, for most of my career. I used to live in Los Angeles a long time ago when I went to Occidental College. And uh, and I've been up here in Portland since 2005. Very cool. So, Marty, let's uh, before we really do like the deep, deep dive here, let's just start right from the top. Uh, what were some of your thoughts kind of broadly on No Country for Old Men? And I'm curious, had you seen the film prior to this engagement? I had seen the film prior. I looked back on my letterbox score that I'd given it, I think it was a 1.5 star, which in my film inventory is very low. That usually means I actively hated it. And I and I do remember hating this movie. I had a very different experience than I know you and Matt talked about on the podcast. He went to go see it three different times with three different people in the theater. You saw it twice. I walked out of the theater feeling so cheated, I think. And I think it was because I felt the movie was empty, that it had nothing to say, that it was uh, violence for violence's sake, and that it was uh, a cheap spectacle in that regard. Upon rewatching it, knowing that I was coming on the show, I, I came to almost the opposite conclusion. I've decided now that it's probably my favorite Coen Brothers movie. I've done a complete 180. In the, in the process of preparing for this podcast, I've changed my mind almost completely. I like it. Whiskey Flick's just out here changing hearts and minds. <laughs> just, uh, <laughs> what would you say would be like the main things that kind of flipped your perception? When I first watched it, my reaction to it was that it was glorifying this sort of nihilistic view of the world and that there really was sort of no morality, good or bad, underneath it that gave it any sort of redeeming value. I still think some of that is there, but I actually think that it is very sort of moralistic in a way and, and that it does have something to say about the world. What I, what I feel now that it's about is it's about belief and disbelief at its core. All of the characters, except Anton Sugar have a moment of disbelief, at least one, where they cannot believe what is happening to them, or they refuse to believe what's happening to them. Anton is fate. He is death. He's the the one constant in the film that comes for everybody. And I and I do think there's something interesting there. Maybe our our lack of ability to see that the world is maybe something that we don't want to think it is. Let's let's take a step back and kind of, you know, take in the film as a whole. So I know you're a huge film buff. Outside of the key themes, outside of those elements, just from a pure technical storytelling, the nuts and bolts of the film, was there anything that stood out to you on that front? The thing I think that stood out to me was something you guys talked about uh, again in the previous episode. I think you did a good job talking about the many things that make this beyond the sort of heavy themes that it's talking about, the you know the cinematography, the lack of music. It really is that silence. How they let just moments play out with long pauses and without music and that opening monologue that's just given almost without uh, I don't think there's even any ambient noise in that. Some wind, I think. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's so well done. And the clips that you played, um, it's almost more apparent when you don't see the visuals, but how many pauses there are in the dialogue. And I think that I really, really like probably more than anything. Those are so important to like the pacing and the ultimate perception of the film. It's so fundamental, like how how Tommy Lee Jones delivers that opening monologue. His words, Cormac McCarthy's books are often like, every word is so carefully chosen. When you have that much silence, it almost makes every line automatically devastating. You know, you can compare it to Big Lebowski, which has a very different cadence. It's a, you know, it's a comedy at heart. It's, it's sort of rapid fire punchlines and reactions. This film is sort of the, the spiritual opposite of that. Now you did, you did spend a good chunk of time talking about your perceptions of Anne Anton, um, who is, I think we can all agree, a fascinating character. Were there any other characters in the film that really stood out to you or that you found interesting insights around like their motivations, where they came from, or, or anything else you got out of those characters? Woody Harrelson's character I want to talk about because I know, uh, I think it was Matt who said he was not a fan of the character. I can see why he thinks that because it, it's almost out of place in this movie and he kind of is a very typical sort of Coen Brothers character airdropped into this Cormac McCarthy sort of bloody landscape. But I think he does serve a purpose in the sense that, you know, he comes in, he's very sort of the, the dapper professional criminal. He knows what's happening. He's in control. He's 
almost sort of a, an echo of other Coen Brothers movies in that sense. But in his final scene, when he is executed, he comes to the same fate. And he also doesn't believe, even though he spent a good time lecturing Llewellyn in the hospital that this man is not to be trifled with, even after sort of giving that speech to Llewellyn, he can't believe it. And he says, you, you don't have to do this. And I think that says something, that sort of slick criminal professionality, even that won't escape the fear and the the devastation that we are going to face when we are faced with our own mortality. That sort of turn for him is really uh, interesting. That that slick archetype is definitely something that, that pops up often in Coen Brothers films. But I think you're right that that sort of confrontation of his own mortality, the turn he has in that hotel room, that scene is the reason why I like Woody Harrelson in this movie. Because I do think up to that point, he is very much, it's Woody Harrelson being Woody Harrelson, playing a Coen Brothers character that you've seen before. I didn't really realize it until the rewatch, and I really realized it when I was pulling the sound clips for the podcast, how nuanced and emotionally complex the performance is in that scene. Like, especially when it's audio only and you can hear the little cracks in his voice as he's like kind of having this barely above a whisper conversation with Anton. To me, it's the performance that makes him in the movie. I like Woody Harrelson a lot. I think he's a talented actor, especially in comedic roles, but not just. He has some dramatic range and that that scene is really incredible. And that clip that you played where Anton asks him, if the rule brought you to this point, was it a good rule? That is such a great line. And to me, it says that there's no escaping death. That line kind of stands out to me a lot. It kind of ties into a few things we've talked about. Taking it all in, the sum of, the, of all of its parts, how would you characterize that philosophical worldview of the film, right? Like we know there's nihilistic elements. We know that there's this like fate and kind of morality uh, play that's happening. What do you see the film as trying to say about those things? And I kind of have to answer that question by taking a detour to talk about Fargo. Because after I rewatched this movie, I felt an overpowering urge to go rewatch Fargo, which which I loved. The characters in it are also vivid. William H. Macy's sort of almost tangible desperation is just so fun to watch. His his sort of spiral into to absolute chaos as he tries to hold everything together. Fargo has so much to do with this movie. There, there's a lot of overlap. It's hard to know where in No Country Cormac McCarthy ends and the Coen brothers begin. But the, the structure of Fargo is very similar. There's there's sort of a folksy cop who always has sort of uh, wisdom to give. She, she's sort of very uh, self-assured. And, and there's this sort of warm, like, familial center to the movie. But the themes are very different. They're sort of like well-intentioned people who get dragged into darker and darker crimes. Um, and there's also this character, Steve Buscemi's associate, he is the sort of pre-Anton. Before Anton existed, there was this character. Because he he adds a certain chaotic violence, unpredictable violence to the movie. And he's the sort of the reason why things eventually spiral completely out of control. He sort of meets out his own version of justice. But the message I get from that film is not that the world is bad, but that people are bad. Margie and Norm can sort of sleep soundly at night knowing that they're probably pretty safe. The world is okay. No Country takes those same elements, sort of the folksy cop, the sort of out of control, violent criminal who meets out his own justice and comes to almost the opposite conclusion. As much as we might want to believe that we're okay, we're not. That's very a dark thought. And I think why I was sort of like viscerally affected by the movie when I first watched it, I, I sort of rejected that. It speaks to me more now. I feel like you don't leave Fargo with the same sense of evil or a criminality or a darkness that is insurmountable, right? Like, you know, Tommy Lee Jones even uses the phrase, uh, or when, he, when he's meeting with Ellis, he talks about how he feels outmatched, right? And that feeling, I, I, I think, ends the film, right? Like, you leave that film feeling like he was, he, like, he's not up to task. This is like an insurmountable evil. And I don't feel like Fargo carries that same weight at the ending. Like to your point, it kind of feels like 
things are largely under control and that, you know, Francis McDormand as the folksy cop should be able to wrangle whatever might come their way kind of thing. But it doesn't feel like that's the case. I mean, Tommy Lee Jones character, Sheriff Bell, literally exits his life as a sheriff, <laughs> you know, in, in part from this experience. To me, that's that final monologue. It's a continuation of his opening monologue in a lot of ways. In the opening monologue, he asks questions. And it's why I think this movie is about belief. Um, he talks about this kid who killed a 14-year-old girl. The, the ending of that opening monologue is a man would have to put his soul at hazard. He would have to say, okay, I'll be part of this world. And the movie starts there. It's, it's sort of a rejection of wanting to be a part of a world where something like that could happen. And I think that plays out in almost all of the deaths that follow is people refuse to believe that something so terrible would really happen or some, somebody who really is out to kill them or that Anton is going to kill them. In the final monologue, I read it as Tommy Lee Jones and Tom Bell actually coming to terms with it. He, uh, you know, he talks about this dream that he had of his father. And in the dream, I knew that he was going on ahead and he was fixing to make a fire somewhere out there and all that dark and all that cold. And I knew that whenever I got there, he'd be there. And then I woke up. To me, the, the, the key line there is, then I woke up. He no longer has his eyes closed to the fact that is a fiction, this sort of uh, a fiery warmth in the darkness. He's clear-eyed about what the world actually is now. He might be retired, but he's seen it for what it is. Interesting. So you don't see that ending then as a uh, a lean into the past. You see it more as an acceptance of the present. Correct. You know, it's it's dark. Accepting that maybe the world doesn't have any comforts in it unless we bring it ourselves. That, that's a dark thought. But I also think it's a thought that speaks to me now as somebody who's going on 40. When you're young, you don't want to think about your own death. You don't want to think about mortality. I don't necessarily think this movie is about a 40-year-old going through his uh, midlife crisis thinking about like the day that he's going to die but uh, but I do think the themes are the same it's like as you grow older that sort of acceptance of death is never going to be without fear there is sort of like this resignation on Ed Tom Bell's and uh, Tommy Lee Jones's character that this is how the world is and um, he's no longer dreaming that's a read I've never thought of but I'm, I'm like super on board with it with Sheriff Bell being the narrator of the film it feels fair to say that his worldview would be largely the worldview that we're supposed to hold of the, the fictional world. Do you think that the Coens are putting that out there because they see that as like a mirror of the real world? Or do you think that the Coens are trying to say something else about that? That's a great question. I don't know the answer to that. To my earlier point where I sort of said it's hard to sort of separate Carmack McCarthy and the Coen brothers, having read some other, I haven't actually read this book, but I've read other Cormac McCarthy books that I really liked. Uh, Blood Meridian is probably my one of my favorite novels of all time. The Road as a novel is amazing. He really plays around with these themes a lot. And the Coen brothers also toy with those themes in other movies of theirs. So it's, it's hard to say, like, are they uh, just faithfully adapting a book that's not theirs? Are they developing themes? I haven't seen these themes, you know, even though there are echoes to, like Fargo and to other things. I don't see quite as extreme in their other movies. This movie is a little bit of a philosophical outlier for them, maybe. It feels like such an outlier would serve the purpose of trying to almost like reverse commentary. <laughs> I, I can't suss it out beyond that gut feeling, I guess. Now, Marty, I did want to actually circle back to, because you've mentioned it a few times now, you've talked about belief, right? And how you think that ultimately this film is about belief, disbelief, and those kind of pieces. I think a, a, an interesting overlap with that, how religion plays into all of this, right? Because religion is, you know, for a film that would focus around belief and about morality and, and ethics and all this kind of stuff, religion's largely absent. Sheriff Bell even verbatim in his conversation with Ellis near the end of the film talks about how he always assumed at some point God would come into his life, but he didn't, which is like one of the bleakest lines ever. With you kind of ascribing to the film as being about belief, how do you think religion or lack thereof feeds into that? 
That's a great question. And I, I thought about that scene specifically. Pretty much every scene in this movie has these sort of gems of dialogue that you can sort of play around with forever and ever and read from so many different angles. When he talks about God there, it's it's hard to know if he's really reliably sort of narrating his own inner life or if he is missing something. And by what I mean is like maybe in some ways God is there and don't want to overplay this metaphor that Anton is God, but he's a stand-in for a similar concept, which is something inevitable, something that uh, not everybody believes in, but he's always there, uh, whether or not you see him. And, he, you know, as you brought up in that first interview that I think was an, an amazing point, is there's so many interactions between Anton and some of the other characters where they don't physically see each other at all. And uh, they, they maybe see, like, a blood trail or uh, or something something else. And I do think that he has that godlike presence in the movie. Like, he's there whether or not people believe in him at all. In my mind, when Tommy Lee Jones is talking about God never having entered his life, even as he got older, I think we're supposed to maybe think that his character is missing something, that, that he's still not quite at that point in that final monologue where he's sort of completely opened his eyes to, like, maybe God has come here. It's just not the God that he imagines, which is sort of merciful and good. But there there is something underpinning the world that is constant. I am very aware that that might be pushing the metaphor way too far. <laughs> so so I, I don't know if I completely believe in that reading of it, but it's the only one I really have, because I don't think the movie is about religion, and I don't think it's really about whether there is a god or there isn't a god. I think it's more about the stories that people tell themselves about the world. I think it's really fascinating. I've never really thought of the idea of Anton being kind of in that space. And it's it's interesting because he he embodies some of those characteristics, but not, right? Like he's omnipresent, but not omniscient, right? Like he seems to be everywhere, but he doesn't always know everything. And I think it arguably makes him more terrifying that he is man, right? It's, all, it's like the inevitability of evil from within, I guess, or like the darkness of humanity. And it almost feels like maybe that's what they're trying to drive home with the the car accident sequence of showing he is fallible he can be hurt he is man and that makes him all the more terrifying because he is a, a real dude that's capable of bleeding and yet he is this unstoppable force throughout the film i like that reading the one scene i don't want to forget to talk about because I, I think it, it goes nicely with this discussion of god um or lack of god is the accountant after he goes and executes Stephen root's character in the high rise you know he's it, the murder is witnessed by this accountant who happened to be in the same room and the accountant asks a really interesting question which is are you going to shoot me not are you going to kill me are you going to shoot me uh, he doesn't quite believe in the finality of it um, if he does get shot but Anton turns to him and says well that depends do you see me and the scene ends there um, and it and it is like with Llewellyn Moss's wife. It's the only sort of other murder or not murder in the movie that doesn't get resolved on on screen. We we actually don't know what happens to this accountant. And that question that he asks him that depends. Do you see me? Is a really crucial one. Um, does he mean? Do you see me? As in, are you going to tell the cops like what I look like? I don't think he. I don't think Anton is worried about that. What he actually means is like, do you see me for who I am? Do you really believe that I can kill you right now? And and I think most of the characters in the movie do not. Um, and but that that sort of question that he gives him is is it gets to that. How deep is your belief in the goodness of this world? And then from there, as an audience what do we believe happened? It's hard to say, like, why Why didn't they show it? Why didn't they resolve it? Uh, same with, you know, Llewellyn Moss's wife. Um, why didn't they resolve that on screen? Like, what's the question that they want us to be left with? I, I do agree with you that I think it's it's clear that he did kill her, but the, the choice to not show it and the choice to make it ambiguous is an interesting one. And it feels intentional, for sure. I mean, obviously, in a film with that much graphic violence, 
to lay off the gas <laughs> in, a, in a pivotal moment feels very, very on purpose. Uh, Marty, some really, really great insights on this movie. You've got my wheels turning so much. Like I'm literally ready to go rewatch this movie now with so, some new lenses and some new perspective. But before we do wrap up, again, we've covered a lot of ground. We've gone a lot of different places. Are there any other kind of final thoughts, takeaways, or big ideas that that you really that really stood out to you about No Country for Old Men that you wanted to share? Um, you know, you guys talked a little bit about nihilism in the previous interview, and I, I don't know if I see the movie as nihilist. I actually think it, in a very sick and dark way, it does believe in something. It's not nothing. It's not the absence of anything. It's really the presence of, or the inescapability of death, I think, is what it believes in. And as a person going on 40, that speaks to me. The film is just one giant grim reaper. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I think there is a there's a fair interpretation of the movie that focuses on the characters without referencing any grand philosophical themes. I think you can make a convincing case for reading the movie as a character study in evil and that Anton is really evil and there are these sort of really rich characters around him. As empty and as desolate as the landscape is, it does feel very rich in character. But I don't think the more apocalyptic symbolic readings of it are to be dismissed entirely. I do think there is some weird determinism, fatalistic determinism going on with Anton's character and that nobody really can believe that that is what is, uh, makes the world go round. The canvas is almost as blank and empty as the West Texas landscape. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. And you, can kind of, and you can kind of layer different readings on it depending on your perceptions and maybe what you bring to it and what things stand out to you. Uh, all right, well, before I wrap up to, to lighten it up as we close up shop, I did want to give you a chance to get in on some of the fun that we also had last week. So the, the first one I'm curious about is genre. Obviously, this film is a total genre-bending movie. How would you characterize the film? Matt and I kind of went back and forth on it a little bit. I'm curious to know what you're taking. It's, it's not an easy one. And obviously, it, it's got some elements of a Western. It's got some elements of a noir. It's got some elements of crime caper. You know, like, how would you classify Fargo, really? Increasingly complex criminal caper, I would say, that, that turns very dark and ugly. And, it, and this movie definitely has those elements. But because of all the sort of symbolism and, the, and determinism that I think it's talking about, I'm going to go with it's an apocalypse movie. That's that's It's really about the end of everything. That's that's what I think it is. There's no asteroid. There's no ancient Mayan uh, prophecy that ending the world. There's really just walking death. Again, it, it's we, we keep landing on these like increasingly more terrifying conclusions. It's not <laughs> it's not zombies or aliens or asteroids or the sun imploding that bring about the end of time. It's humanity. We we take care of it ourselves. <laughs> As dark as that is, you know, it's it's probably the most realistic apocalyptic scenario. <laughs> uh, well, last but not least, Marty, I know you already kind of talked about your love of Fargo. Uh, Matt and I shared, obviously, our top five Coen Brothers flicks. We got to know, how does that top five shake out for you? This rewatch of this movie has completely upended my list. Fargo would have been number one if you had asked me a, uh, a month ago. I'm going to go with No Country for Old Men as number one. Then Fargo. Wow. Then Big Lebowski. Then Oh Brother, Where Art Thou? It, the fifth one is a hard one because there's a lot of ones that I kind of want to squeeze into the list. I really like Blood Simple. I actually really enjoyed The Ballad of Buster Scruggs uh, as sort of silly as it could be. If I have to, if I have to choose I get, I'll go with blood simple I do appreciate that all of the Coen Brothers fandom seems to generally agree on the top four. Where they sit seems to vary, but it seems like that top four is pretty well locked in. People's personality, I guess, is probably, like, you can tell more about what they rank as number five, probably, than number one through four. So. It also kind of says a little bit, like, where the one through three shakes out, too, because, like, so far, everybody that we've talked to has had some combination of No Country, Fargo, and Big Lebowski as their top three. Where they sit kind of varies, so I feel like there's some interpretive things going on there too. Awesome. Well, this was a lot of fun, Marty. Thanks so much for, for hopping in and joining the show this week. I really enjoyed this uh, and I, you know, I'd love to do it again. All right. Let me ask you something. If the rule you followed brought you to this, of what use was the rule? Do you have any idea how crazy you are? You mean the nature of this conversation? I mean the nature of you. <laughs> <laughs>
So those were some of our final thoughts on No Country for Old Men. I hope you enjoyed the interview with Marty. I thought we got into some really interesting insights about the film and a deeper dive into the key themes. One thing I did want to make sure that I added was after I, I wrapped up the interview with Marty, I actually got a follow-up text message from him later that evening where he texted about the Johnny Cash song, uh, The Man Comes Around, that we referenced in last week's episode and its relationship to Anton Sugar, which we highlighted on the show. Uh, Marty actually texted and pointed out that that also kind of ties into those themes around uh, the apocalypse and also uh, some of the God related readings of the film that we talked about in our interview, particularly because Johnny Cash's lyrics, many of them come straight from uh, biblical references. And so there's definitely a lot of really interesting parallels between that song and Anton Chigurh's role as this kind of grim reaper figure in the film, uh, despite the fact that the, the song itself doesn't make an appearance. Overall, No Country for Old Men, a complex film with a lot to say from some incredible film filmmakers. And it's been really, really fun kind of breaking down a, a more serious work and really get a chance to kind of understand a peek behind the curtain and, and figure out what makes a movie like this tick. Before we wrap up this week's show, we did want to dive into, as we always do, some news and notes. And probably the biggest note coming into this week is, of course, The Batman, the biggest movie in the world right now, did open to $128 million at the North American box office this past weekend, which makes it the second highest grossing movie of the pandemic, of course, the highest grossing movie was Spider-Man No Way Home. And the movie has already grossed over $300 million globally. So it has made a ton of money. Now, obviously, this also has had a, a couple of interesting side effects. HBO Max, in response, pretty much right at the end of the weekend, officially greenlit a prequel series featuring Colin Farrell's The Penguin. Uh, so really excited to see more of that character on HBO Max and kind of get into his backstory. Uh, and apparently there was a sizable bump on streaming music services of Nirvana's Something in the Way, which is featured in the film pretty prominently. For those that didn't have a chance to see it, I actually went on opening weekend to go see The Batman. And despite its absurdly long runtime of three hours, it's way too long, y'all. But it is an incredible film. I had so much fun. I, I think that Robert Pattinson might be one of, if not my absolute favorite portrayal of both Batman and Bruce Wayne. I really appreciated him in the role. And this comes from somebody who was a bit of a Robert Pattinson skeptic when he was initially cast. I also have to say that I really appreciated the story that they told as a whole. It was kind of a cool opportunity to get more into a detective type story and less of that kind of big bombastic superhero story that MCU has gotten us all very trained around. So something a little darker, something a little bit more mysterious. It also didn't hurt that it gave off some pretty serious Seven slash Zodiac slash Saw vibes. That's my mini rant on the Batman is it's a time commitment, but it's a commitment worth making. I don't know that there is a better movie currently out in theaters right now. And it's it's up there for me in terms of comic book movies and Batman movies. Now, of course, that wasn't all that Warner Brothers was up to this week. They actually pushed back a few different DC films this week. So kind of a mixed message on box office. Batman's making a lot of money, but they pushed back some of their other films. Uh, in particular, Aquaman 2, Black Adam, and The Flash were all pushed back, although Shazam 2 was moved up. So a little bit of moving and shaking with some of these big DC films that are on the horizon. Last but not least, uh, we did get a little bit of news on a kind of an interesting property that, I, that I've had my eye on for a while, which is the Munsters at Universal, for those that aren't aware. Uh, Rob Zombie has been tasked with uh, directing a Munsters film for Universal, and production has finished, and it's officially rated PG, which is shocking to think about for a Rob Zombie movie. If you've ever seen House of a Thousand Corpses, The Devil's Rejects, or any other of Rob Zombie's very violent, very grotesque horror films, uh, you'll know that a PG film from him is a little crazy. But from what I hear, he's actually a diehard Munsters fan. So knowing all of this actually has me a little bit more excited to see the film. As always, we want to close out our show with the soundtrack. What are you listening to this week? And I was trying to think about what songs would make sense if I had any more, you know, songs in the tank for No Country for Old Men. Uh, and when I was at the gym earlier this week, a song came up on my workout playlist and say what you will about fate and determinism and luck and all the things that this film is trying to say, but it certainly stood out to me that a song like this popped up on my playlist. Uh, and it is a song by the recently departed Every Time I Die, one of the, one, like one of my favorite heavy bands and their song, The Coin Has a Say. It just seemed a little too serendipitous to avoid. 
Last but not least, other than the Batman, what's living in my head rent free this week? I'll keep this rant short and sweet because it's a topic I've talked about a few times on this podcast, but it's especially pertinent because of the day that I'm recording this. Officially, baseball is back. MLB and the Players Union have come to an agreement, which means we will get a full season of baseball in short order, which is incredibly exciting. I've certainly said plenty of things on this podcast about Rob Manfred and my thoughts on ownership, but above all else, I'm very, very happy uh, that the team and the players will get to play ball and I'm looking forward to making my way out to a few games this year. So just a a little bit of excitement around the return of baseball. Thanks again for joining us this week for Whiskey Flick. Remember to hit that subscribe button and if you like what you hear, throw us a review to help others find our show. We'll be back in your feed next Friday as we continue our journey into these dark corners of the Lone Star State with 1974's genre-defining the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. I could not be more excited to dive into this as it's one of my all-time favorite horror flicks. As always, we want to hear from you. Hit us up on social media at Whiskey Flick Pod to join our polls or share your takes, you can email us at whiskeyflickpod at gmail.com, or as always, call the Whiskey Flick hotline at 818-660-6369 and tell us your thoughts on the Texas Chainsaw Massacre or whatever else is on your mind this week for a chance to be featured on an upcoming show. As always, be sure to check out our friends Tony and Matt over at the 58 West King Fantasy Football Podcast, and of course, our friend Nate over at the Taco Court Podcast. They've got all kinds of great segments, uh, even in the offseason around sports betting, uh, around fantasy football. They do fun bits. Matt mentioned on our previous episode about an upcoming show that they're doing on 58 West King about coaching across the league, right? So a lot of different insights if you're into sports and and betting and all those kinds of pieces. And of course, you can always find the links to both of those shows in our show notes. So check them out and give them a listen. You can follow our show at Whiskey Flick Pod on all socials. You can follow me at Terrence Dunn 13 or Matt at Graham the Man 69 on Twitter. Thanks as always for checking out Whiskey Flick. We will see you next week with Leatherface and the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Until then, keep the whiskey flowing and the flicks going. We'll see you next week. What's the most you ever lost on a coin toss?